It's 9.05 on the morning of November the 10th. Every year since 1938, Turkey has commemorated the death of the man who founded the country as a secular republic. The retreat of the Ottoman Empire from Europe lasted more than a century, but its final disintegration took just four years, a consequence of the First World War. Its last territories in Arabia, Mesopotamia, Syria and Palestine became the modern-day Middle East. Borders and states were formed, resulting in conflicts that periodically flare up to this day. On April the 25th, 1915, French and British troops attempted to land on the Gallipoli Peninsula in the Dardanelles Strait. The Ottoman Empire had been at war since November 1914 as an ally of Germany, the Austro-Hungarian Empire and Bulgaria. The Ottoman army, led by the German commander Lehmann von Saunders and the young Ottoman officer Mustafa Kemal, was able to force back the Allies on Gallipoli. Half a million people lost their lives, and yet Gallipoli was a victory for the Ottomans, one of only a few in a war in which they only reluctantly participated. Since 1913, the Ottoman government had been headed by an authoritarian nationalist triumvirate that had emerged from the Young Turk Revolution. Jamal Pasha, the Minister of the Navy. Talat Pasha, the Interior Minister. And Enver Pasha, the War Minister. He was the strongest advocate of the alliance with Germany. When war became inevitable, the three pashas aligned the Ottoman Empire with Germany. From Istanbul to the border of Anatolia, from Palestine to Yemen, mobilization occurred in all the remaining Ottoman provinces. In 1914 was supposed to bring about the Turkish revenge on history, the historical turning point. But from the very first battles, the Turks fared badly. Neither the First nor the Second World War saw the Turks avenge their history. The Ottomans stood their ground in the west, but they faced a debacle in the east. In 1915, Enver Pasha went on the offensive against Russia. He wanted to conquer back lost territories in the Caucasus and expand the empire into Central Asia. Winter became a trap. Typhoid, cholera and hunger decimated the poorly equipped Ottoman troops, at times even before any fighting had occurred. But rather than accept responsibility for this disaster, the Ottoman high command sought a scapegoat in the Armenians. Allegedly, the Armenians had collaborated with the Russians. Turkey cited a much exaggerated number of eight and a half thousand Armenians who it said had collaborated with the Russians. 
Given that around 13 million soldiers on the Russian side and several million Muslim soldiers on the Ottoman side fought in World War I, eight and a half thousand people is a drop in the ocean. The entire Armenian population was accused of these, quote, crimes. They were going to be targeted for collective measures by the Ottoman state that would lead to the eradication of the Armenian population of eastern Anatolia and effectively the first modern genocide in history. On April the 24th, 1915, some 200 primarily Armenian intellectuals were arrested and murdered in Istanbul, an event that marks the beginning of the genocide. Armenians in Anatolia were deported to the Syrian desert where they were murdered. The German military mission stood by without intervening. Two thirds of the Armenian population, more than a million people, were killed. The slaughter of the Armenians is evidence of the Ottoman Empire's national chauvinism. There was no room for Christians anymore. Its hardcore was Turkish and its margins exclusively Muslim. In his role as caliph, Sultan Mehmed V called for jihad, Islamic holy war, when the empire entered the conflict. By calling for solidarity with the Ottoman Empire, he aimed to provoke Muslim uprisings in the colonies of the Entente powers. The borders of the Ottoman Empire were under threat from all sides. Russia advanced to Persia, France controlled North Africa, and British-occupied Egypt was used as a base for Allied operations. By calling for jihad, the Ottomans sought to destabilize the enemy from within. The Ottoman Minister of the Navy, Jamal Pasha, was appointed Governor General of Ottoman Syria. It covered the territory made up today of Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Palestine and Jordan. Jamal Pasha had his sights set on reconquering Egypt and expanding the Arab and Muslim margins that protected the Turkish heart of the empire. But his campaign against the British forces on the Suez Canal failed. The call for holy war failed to unite Muslims in support of the Ottoman Empire. Quite the opposite. Resentment was stirring in its Arab provinces over the increasingly centralised and authoritarian government of the young Turks. More than anything, Jamal Pasha feared subversive activity by opposition movements. The Navy Minister Jamal Pasha maintained an extensive network of spies in an effort to discredit Arab intellectuals and politicians with all means possible. The opposition Ottoman Administrative Decentralization Party was very prominent at the time. Rather than advocating independence for the empire's Arab provinces, it sought to regain their pre-war autonomy. It also demanded two official languages in each region, Turkish and the local language, to end the dominance of Turkish in the education system and the judiciary. Jamal Pasha responded to these demands with a heavy hand. In spring 1916, Arab intellectuals and activists were arrested and executed as traitors in Damascus, Beirut and Jerusalem. In a very concentrated four-year period, peoples in the Arab provinces suffered in an unprecedented way. 
that had made the burden of living under Ottoman rule unbearable for the average Arab Ottoman citizen. It made them very angry with their state, and it made them want out. The Ottomans banked on Hussein bin Ali, the Sharif of Mecca, to throw the weight of his moral authority behind their holy war. As an heir of the Hashemite dynasty, Hussein was the guardian of the sacred sites of Mecca and Medina. But his agenda sought to liberate the Arab lands from Ottoman rule and establish a single, independent and unified Arab state. The young Turks rejected negotiations and threatened to remove him. The British, on the other hand, offered him everything he wanted, the independence of the Ottoman Arabs from Mesopotamia to Palestine under his leadership, if he rebelled against Turkey. Jamal Pasha's reign of terror spurred him to action. In June 1916, Sharif Hussein called upon the Arabs to revolt against the empire. His son, Emir Faisal, was put in charge of the rebellion. A young Englishman stood by his side, an archaeologist who was now working as a secret agent. Thomas Edward Lawrence better known as Lawrence of Arabia. They conquered Aqaba and pinned down the troops of the empire on several fronts, enabling a British advance to Palestine. In December 1917, the British general, Edmund Allenby, made a triumphant entry into Jerusalem. With the arrival of General Allenby and his Indian troops, they formed the foundation of the British army at the time, the war was practically over, and with it, all the suffering it had caused. Some also saw this as the end of the Ottoman Empire, in particular, the end of the oppression by Chemal Pasha and his military administration. Damascus fell at the end of September 1918. Faisal immediately installed a provisional government. After just four years, the break between the Arabs and the Ottoman Empire was complete. The Ottoman army and its German allies capitulated on all fronts, from Palestine to Mesopotamia. Sultan Mehmed V died in July 1918. His brother succeeded him on the throne as Mehmed VI. When Germany, the Austro-Hungarian Empire and Bulgaria were also forced to retreat from the front in Europe, he was forced to accept a truce a short while later, on October 30th, 1918. The three Pashas, Talat, Enver and Jamal, who had taken the empire into war, fled on board a German submarine two days later. The Ottoman Empire was in ruins. Ottoman government is very conscious that if they don't take action quickly to demonstrate to the outside world that they are responding to the war crimes of the young Turks with severity, that they would have 
a sort of suitable punishment imposed on them by the outside powers as part of the, as part of the settlement. It's largely unknown in the West that immediately after the armistice, the Ottoman government convened a tribunal to put on trial those held responsible for the organization or for the perpetration of the massacre of Armenians. Hundreds of leading officials from the provincial level right up to the central government were arrested or were tried in absentia. Dozens were found guilty and convicted uh, to death. Three were actually hanged for their crimes, uh, some quite senior in the chain of command leading to the murder of thousands of Armenians. Though obviously those most responsible, the architects of the genocide, had already fled Ottoman domains and would not be subject to Ottoman justice. As much as the new Ottoman government tried to distance itself from its young Turk predecessors, it was unable to prevent the fragmentation of the empire. The Paris Peace Conference began on January the 18th, 1919. Faisal arrived with Thomas Edward Lawrence to remind the British of their promise, the prize of an Arab kingdom. But promises only bind those who believe in them. During the war, Britain had secretly reached an agreement with its ally, France, against Ottoman interests. Mark Sykes, a British agent, and François-Georges Picot, a French diplomat, had negotiated a plan to divide the Ottoman provinces. In the south, Britain took Mesopotamia, where it had secured several oil concessions. In the north, France wanted to extend its area of influence in Syria, it had a long history of ties to the region, having protected Christian Maronites in Lebanon since the 19th century. The Sykes-Picot agreement made no mention of Faisal's kingdom. The secret deal carried more weight than the promise made to the emir. France was given a mandate for Syria. The British withdrew and left Faisal to fend for himself against France. On July 24th, 1920, a final battle took place near Maisalum. Four days later, Faisal was forced into exile. It was the ultimate British betrayal of the promises that they'd made to the Hashemites and was to remain what for Arab nationalists would prove the unresolved failure of the British to uphold their promises to the Arabs, to their right to shape their own future. And in so doing, of course, created the problem that would bedevil the Arab world right through the 20th century of reconciling the legitimacy of the frontiers in which the states of the Arab world uh, would be made to live, not just in Syria, but in Iraq, in Jordan, in Palestine, in Lebanon. It was to shape the interwar years as a moment of national struggle by divided Arabs against their European colonial masters. It was to distort Arab politics forever. France gave its Maronite protégés their desired independence, independence from the Ottoman Empire and the rest of Syria. On September the 1st, 1920, the new state of Greater Lebanon was founded in Beirut. To make it more economically viable, the state also incorporated the coastal cities of Tyre and Tripoli, as well as the fertile Bekaa Valley. Further treaties followed the Paris Peace Conference. In San Remo, Sèvres, every treaty further divided the remnants of the Ottoman Empire. When French, British and Italian forces occupied Istanbul, the Ottoman government had to accept renewed territorial losses.
Many of us mourn the loss of the time when the Arab world and the Middle East weren't yet geographically divided. Southern Lebanon and Galilee were one region. The people traveled through Transjordan as if it were all one country. The same thing was true of Syria and Palestine. The people never knew anything else. But when the British came and severed Palestine from its Arab neighbors, that was over. The British received the mandate to administer the formerly Ottoman Palestine, a mandate which also provided for the creation of a Jewish national home in Palestine. The move upheld a different wartime promise, one made to the Zionist movement. It sought a refuge for Jews driven out of Europe. In November 1917, the British Foreign Secretary, Arthur Balfour, stated, his Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. The Ottoman sultans had rejected any deal with the Zionists, even though large Jewish communities had existed since antiquity in Palestine, Jerusalem, Hebron and Safed. The British mandate supported the immigration of European Jews fleeing anti-Semitism and the pogroms in Russia, Ukraine and Poland. New communities with a European background began living alongside locals rooted in Muslim culture. There was virtually no difference between Muslims' relationship to Jews and Christians. There was no antagonistic differentiation between Jews and Arabs in the Ottoman Empire. Nobody would have talked about the Jews or the Arabs. There were different regional groups, and in some villages it was Christians who made up the majority, in others it was Jews. There was coexistence. To this day, we assume that the old city of Jerusalem encompassed four quarters, a Jewish quarter, a Muslim one, an Armenian, and a Christian one. We view every quarter as exclusive. But no, historically, it wasn't like that. A lot of Jews lived in the Muslim quarter. The British, not the Ottomans, introduced this categorization and segregation. It was the British who divided up Jerusalem's old city and issued passports noting citizens' religious affiliation. Jews and Muslims were separated. In 1920 marked the start of the entwinement of religion and nationalism. Religion lent traditional impetus to an ethnic nationalism. But it's not a religious war. And that's the difference from the Middle Ages. It's not a theological conflict. It's a nationalist conflict between ethnic groups. Religion bonded one ethnic group against the others. I think it represents a missed opportunity. Zionist and Palestinian nationalism only reinforced each other. The opportunity of an Arab Zionism, an Arab Jewish identity, a mixing was not seized, even though it existed. Instead, one movement fought the other.
It's an irony of history that the First World War was to end the divisions and the tragedies they had caused. But in reality, it only caused new divisions. It strengthened separatist movements and fostered new religious conflicts. We see across the Middle East pressures emerging from a state system that are a direct legacy uh, of the First World War and have marked the Middle East as a zone of conflict for the past century. It's a sad truth that there really never has been a peace that has brought peace to the Ottoman front. What could be done about the chaos that ensued from the division of the Ottoman Empire? When the British failed to reconcile Zionist and Arab aspirations, they decided to partition Palestine, with the Jewish national home assigned to the west bank of the Jordan River. The east bank, and therefore three quarters of Ottoman Palestine, became Transjordan, modern day Jordan. It was put under the command of Faisal's brother, Abdullah. That quieted one front while another opened up. In June 1920, a major rebellion erupted in Mesopotamia, also British mandated territory. It's not one uprising, it's a series of uprisings. Tribal leaders revolted for different reasons, religious. Holy cities revolted to different reasons. It's only to say no to the British for different reasons. Tribal leaders were angry because they were not paid by the British, while the religious establishment in Najaf and Karbala was angry because of the events taking place in neighboring Iran, where the religious establishment was against British presence in Iran. The strategically important region of Mesopotamia, modern-day Iraq, consisted of three Ottoman provinces. The one around Baghdad, where Sunnis, Shiites, Jews and Christians all lived together. The largely Kurdish Mosul and Basra, which was majority Shiite. The Ottomans had conquered Mesopotamia to protect themselves from their major Shiite rival, the Persian Empire, modern-day Iran. Since the 19th century, Britain had been interested in the region, both because of its oil reserves and its position on one of the communication routes to India. After the rebellion of 1920, colonization was no longer an option. The issue now was to retreat while maintaining British interests. This was the task faced at the conference in Cairo in March 1921 by the new colonial secretary, Winston Churchill. There was only one woman among the 40 conference participants, Gertrude Bell. She would draw up the lines of modern Iraq. After the war, London assigned her the task of devising a plan for Mesopotamia she presented its outline at the Cairo conference. An autonomous kingdom of Iraq was to be established, one that was loyal to the British, headed by Faisal, the son of Sharif Hussein. Faisal, the ally whom the British had turned their back on. That was the argument of Bell. We need this group, loyal, reliable group, to rule Iraq, to form the new ruling native class. But the problem was how to select a person as a king of the new kingdom. That was extremely important uh, issue. So Bell and others thought they will import a royal family like in Europe. So they imitated this idea. 
it was very stupid not to elect someone with, from within Iraq. So they brought someone from uh, Jazeera al Arabiya from the Arab Peninsula, and they thought this will succeed. They will, he will be a symbol of unity. But he did not have any popular basis, no place in our history or in our memory. We were divided society, brought together by force. In August 1921, Faisal was crowned King of Iraq. In the absence of an Iraqi national anthem, the orchestra played God Save the King. How you can create a state with different groups of people, with different traditions, with different languages, different cultures and traditions. So you have to use force, ideological force and physical force, and they failed. She relied in a very tiny group of Sunni, pan-Arabist army officers to build or to create an artificial state. She thought these people are modernist force and they will uh, 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 succeed in creating a modern state. And, you know, by passage of time, it, uh, it, it turned out to be a myth. 2003 put an end to Bell's project. In 2003, the US invaded Iraq. It was the end of an era during which a Sunni clan ruled a Shiite majority and the start of an eight-year war that fueled unparalleled sectarian violence. We replaced the Sunni-dominated army with a Shia Sunni-dominated army. So we did not uh, learn from uh, past mistakes. The chaos of post-war Iraq fostered a rise in Islamic militancy and the emergence of jihadist groups like Islamic State. The civil war raging in Syria facilitated the advance of an army of Sunni jihadists from Iraq. In 2014, its leader, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, declared a new caliphate in the territory of Iraq and Syria. The old borders set up by the Sykes-Picot Agreement were to be swept away. The new order forced upon the ruins of the Ottoman Empire was to be destroyed. In both Iraq and Syria, Kurds found themselves on the front lines in the war against IS. It called attention to the plight of an ancient people with its own history, culture and language, neither Arabic nor Turkish. The Kurds are scattered across modern-day Iraq, Syria and Turkey, a people without a state, forgotten during the division of the Ottoman Empire. Until the 19th century, the Kurds didn't have a national identity. They merely saw themselves as subjects of the Ottoman Empire, as part of Ottoman society. In the Ottoman Empire, identity was defined by religious rather than national terms. There were Muslims and non-Muslims. Since the Kurds were Muslims, they were treated like the majority of Muslims. Although they had semi-autonomous status, they too had to pay taxes and do military service. That prevented the development of a national consciousness until the end of the 19th century. Only when the Ottoman era came to an end did this consciousness arise in reaction to the empire's Turkification. That's when they realized they were different. 
They were oppressed. They had been assimilated and extinguished. They developed their autonomy under this pressure. After the Ottomans were defeated, there were plans to create a state for the Kurds. That's what it says in the Treaty of Sèvres, which settled the details of the breakup of the Ottoman Empire. An autonomous Kurdish region was to be established in eastern Anatolia, neighbouring an Armenian state. The Ottoman Empire would then be limited to the region around Istanbul and western Anatolia, but the provisions of Sevres were never implemented. Resistance to Ottoman rule grew in Anatolia, a weakened and discredited regime because it had accepted the humiliating peace treaty of Sevres. It wasn't long before a national liberation army emerged as a result. A Turkish army that fought for the restoration of sovereignty. It was led by the hero of Gallipoli, Mustafa Kemal. He established a provisional government in Ankara, in Anatolia. He no longer recognized the authority of the Sultan. Nothing could stop his army. In September 1922, he marched into Greek-occupied Smyrna, modern-day Izmir. The town was razed, the Greek population massacred. The last troops loyal to the Sultan surrendered. Mehmed VI was forced to step down, the imperial Ottoman family sent into exile. Mustafa Kemal abolished the Sultanate and on October the 29th, 1923, he proclaimed a new Turkish Republican state. The Treaty of Lausanne replaced that of Sevres and recognized the existing borders. There would be no Kurdish state. The Turkish national identity was ethnically defined, Turk, Anatolian and Sunni Muslim, the former hard core of the Ottoman Empire. Mustafa Kemal wanted to create a modern secular state that put the past behind. But just as in the previous century, religious identity continued to inform national identity. For the very first time is emerging in the modern era a Muslim state that can tell Christian states where to stop, which it had done. That was the achievement of Ataturk. So I think for the Republicans, the, the Turkish national pride and the consolidation of a national consciousness is bound up from the start with this sense of having done something that the Ottomans for several centuries had been unable to do, which is to hold Western power at bay. At the same time as becoming Western. After the First World War, the nation state asserted itself, but what was to be done about minority ethnic groups? Greece and the newly established Turkish Republic opted for a radical solution. Starting in 1924, 500,000 Muslims were expelled from Greece and almost a million Greek Orthodox Christians from Turkey. In 
Entire villages were abandoned. Centuries of coexistence and shared history were over. The Ottoman Empire was finished for good. I think every empire is by definition too big. Too big in size and also in composition. An empire can exist as long as no claim is laid on citizenship. As soon as such a claim is made, a state must be founded. But on what basis? On an ethnic, linguistic or confessional basis? I think the Ottoman, Russian and Austro-Hungarian empires weren't able to resolve this question. In the historical context of the 19th and 20th centuries, this decline was inevitable. Though it didn't necessarily have to proceed in this way. Shouldn't the end of the Ottoman Empire with its long history of chaos and violence make us think about states, nations and borders? About other models of living together, about types of unions to heal the wounds caused by the division of the empire. Wounds in the Balkans and in the Middle East that still undermine hopes for stability in the world today.